thing, I would like to make a couple of couple of comments. Uh, well, I actually heard Professor Ting for the first time in 1992 in Isvegri, the eighth edition in Ann Arbor. And that time he was reporting results uh, from L3, some of the very exciting results. And I have no doubt we'll hear more exciting results from AMS. And uh, we really look forward to uh, listening to him. Uh, so, Sam, please go ahead and you may share your screen. We are ready to okay. hear you. Okay, good morning. Good morning. Well, good afternoon for you, I guess. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, uh, let me rem just a minute remove this. So, let me share with you the result of AMS on the International Space Station for 10 years. And this is the first time I attend this important conference. Let's see. Uh, I first want to acknowledge Igor Mostelenko, Sonia Gupta, Rao Sakdeyev, Zubir Sakar, and Johan Plumper. AMS is providing cosmic ray information in absolute value to 1% accuracy. It is a precision particle physics detector using accelerators. On top, on the left, is the transition radiation detector identified electrons and positrons, followed by nine layer of silicon tracker, measure charge and momentum, followed by Brain image chunk of counter measure Z and energy. The chunk, this chunk of counter has 11,000 photosensors. 17 radiation lens electromagnetic calorimeter measure energy of electron positron. Lower time of flight, upper time of flight measure charge and energy. A magnet together with the nine layer tracker identify sign of the charge and momentum or rigidity. A veto counter reject particle from the side. And so the detector provides independent information and cosmic rays for electrons, for protons, ion, positron, antiproton, and antihelium. We measure all the elementary particles as well as cosmic nuclei systematically from hydrogen to as high as we can. What we measure is the momentum charge, rigidity, energy, and flux. During these 10 years, this detector is constantly monitored. So monitor is carried out every two minutes by cosmic rays, and this is the stability of the first level. This is the monitor of stability of first layer counter, layer one, over 10 years. It has a stability 2.2 microns. And this is the monitor of the ninth layer, the bottom layer, also 2.3 microns. Inside tracker is measured with the laser alignment to one micron. So let me share with all of you the latest with our IMS on the origin of high energy elementary particles, protons, positrons, electrons, and antiprotons. Most of the particles have three possible origins. Cosmic gray collision with interstellar media produce positron, electron, antiproton. Dark matter, if it is in particle form, collide, produce positron, electron, antiproton. Most new astrophysics sources such as pulsars produce positrons and electrons. This is our latest measurement based on 1 billion protons. The absolute accuracy is 1%. It's all checked with few independent measurements from the, from the experiment. The positron flux is the sum of low energy part from cosmic ray collisions plus an unexpected high energy part of new origins. 
most importantly, the higher energy part must have cutoff energy Es. So the spectrum can be expressed as a there's a solar phys, solar uh, uh, solar energy part and the collision from cosmic rays and then a new origin. The new origin must have a one over Es cutoff. The existence of finite energy cutoff is established at 4.5 sigma net level. And all you have to do is use the flux and do a contour fit of the normalization versus Es. And you will notice that 4.5 sigma, one over Es is equal to zero, or Es is equal to infinity. The finite energy cutoff, Es, is a new and unexpected observation. The positron spectrum from very low energy to high energy is based on 3.4 million positrons. And it fits to the model with dark matter with the mass of 1.5 TV. And this model, of course, includes the low energy positron collisions. This fit does not mean we have seen dark matter. We need more data to see how the spectrum fall off at high energies. We have now 50 million electrons, not electron plus positron, electrons. The electron spectrum is a contribution, has a contribution of a positron term, the excess positron, plus two power laws, power law A, plus power law B, and plus an existing positron term. So there is a charge symmetric positron term and electron term, both existing electrons and in positrons. Let me share with you the properties of antiprotons. The antiprotons and positron flux have identical rigidity dependence. On the left is the positron spectrum, on the right is the antiproton spectrum. Antiprotons based on 0.8 million antiprotons. There's a, a very nice theory just recently developed by Subir Sakhar uh, explaining cosmic ray antimatter with secondary from all supernova remnant. And they can explain all 3.4 million positrons, and but different, not yet able to explain antiprotons. The second property, this positron antiproton ratio is energy independent. If you look at the positron to antiproton flux ratio, and the flux ratio is 1.99 plus minus 0 0.03 plus minus 0 0.05, all the way up to half a TeV. The third property is the antiproton to proton ratio show that unexpectedly, above 60 GV, the ratio is energy independent. And this ratio cannot be explained from classical cosmic ray collisions, and uh, as by Johannesson, as well as from the latest model from Subir Sakal. It is flat. Let me now share with you the results from precision measurement of cosmic rays in 10 years, we have studied 15 elements. In the next 10 years, we will improve, we will upgrade the detector, study the other 14 elements. When I say study, we want to have the accuracy order of a percent. We have five detectors independently measure the elements, and this is the correlation between the time of flight counters and five layer, uh, nine layer of silicon trackers. We'll publish the result when we reach order of percent accuracy. Primary cosmic rays, proton, helium, carbon, oxygen, are produced during the lifetime of stars and accelerated by supernovas, everybody know. They propagate through interstellar media before reach the Earth. Measurement of primary cosmic ray flux 
are fundamental to the understanding of origin, acceleration, propagation process of cosmic ray in the galaxy. Before AMS, there were many results of light cosmic ray helium carbon oxygen. I listed on the right all the previous measurements. And this is mostly from balloons and satellites, from up to order of TeV. This is all result. Unexpectedly, above 60 TV, the light cosmic ray have identical rigidity dependence. And you can see from 60 TV to 200 TV, you have one rigidity dependence. Above 200 TV, you have another rigidity dependence. Unexpectedly, heavier primary cosmic ray, neon, magnetum, silicon, have their own identical rigidity dependence but they are different from helium carbon oxygen. Therefore, primary cosmic ray have at least two classes. Neon magnetum silicon is the pink one, and helium carbon oxygen is the green one. And from very low energy up to multi TV. Iron, which is a heaviest element we've published so far, we've studied neon, and zinc already, not accurate enough to be published. Iron is uh, in the helium carbon primary cosmic group instead of the neighbor heavier neon mechanism silicon, uh, silicon group. So helium carbon oxygen ion is one class, neon mechanism silicon is another class. Secondary cosmic ray, lithium, brilliant, boron, fluorine, you are produced a collision primary cosmic ray with interstellar medium. Medium and secondary cosmic ray nuclei are important in understanding the propagation of cosmic ray in the galaxies. Unexpectedly, light secondary cosmic ray, lithium, brilliant, boron, have identical rigidity dependence but are different from primary cosmic ray. I was always amazed how accurately they follow each other. The absolute value is different, but the functional behavior is exactly the same. Secondary cosmic ray also have two classes. Fluorine is different from neon magnesium silicon. Then we'll study secondary to primary ratio. The ratio of secondary flux to primary flux directly measure the amount and property of interstellar medium. Before AMS, the secondary to primary ratio boron over carbon were assumed to be proportional to rigidity to the delta power where delta is a constant independent of rigidity and Z or rigidity above 60 GV. This is our measurement of property of cosmic ray and this is the prediction of modern cosmic ray theory. And you can see below 200 GeV, lithium over carbon, brilliant over carbon, boron over carbon has one value. Above 200 GeV has a different value. Similarly, for lithium over oxygen, brilliant over oxygen, boron over oxygen. And so they are not constant. Constant would be in this shaded area. And so the difference between the high rigidity part and low rigidity part is 5.6 seconds. And so boron over carbon or, or is not a constant as function of rigidity. Another important property is uh, Z dependence. In theory, the light cosmic ray and heavy cosmic ray have same propagation properties. And therefore, fluorine versus silicon divided by boron over oxygen should be constant. All results show that propagation properties of heavy cosmic rays are different from those of light, light cosmic rays. And this is fluorine over silicon compared to boron over carbon. And above 10 GeV, it is not flat as you expected. But if, if you fit to uh, uh, kappa times R to the delta, delta is seven sigma from zero. 
Then there's the third group of consumer grade. We have the primary consumer grade and secondary consumer grade. We observe that there's a third group, nitrogen, sodium, aluminum, who are produced in both in stars and interstellar media. In fact, for sodium, there's a significant portion in primary and significant portion in secondary, similarly for nitrogen and aluminum. And this can be easily seen. The sodium, the dotted point is our measurement, and there is function rigidity from 6 GV to 2 GV. And this flux is the sum of secondary flux fluorine at 1.36 times fluorine plus primary flux silica. You add up this two, and remarkably, they can follow the entire energy means. And similarly, for aluminum, which is 1.05 times fluorine, and plus 0.103 plus, uh, times silicon. And nitrogen is 0.62 times boron, and plus 0.09 times oxygen. And so also the primary component increases with the rigidity. So the, aband the abundance ratio at the source, sodium or silicon 0.036, that's here, and aluminum or sil silicon 0.013 in here, nitrogen over oxygen 0.09 are determined independent of cosmic ray propagation. So the 15 elements we have measured can be grouped into two primary classes, two secondary classes, and one in between. We also study light isotopes, and this provides unique information for production propagation of secondary cosmic ray, lithium 6 and 7, boron 10 and 11, and the age of cosmic rays, beryllium 9 and 10. So let me show you a few examples. This is iso lithium six compared with ACE and Weber, which is major low energy, and this is the MS measurement. And this is also lithium seven. Analysis of this result show lithium does not have a significant primary component. And you measure beryllium isotopes of beryllium 7, the MS measurement from half a GV to 10, 10 TV, uh, more than 10 GV overseas. And this is an early measurement. So this is for beryllium 7, beryllium 9, and beryllium 10. We also study antimatter in the cosmos. Matter, of course, is defined by its mass m and charge z. Antimatter has the same mass but opposite charge. Antimatter can be produced from cosmic collision with interstellar media, produce positron electron antiproton. Dark matter collision produce positron electron antiproton antideuton. If there's an antimatter star, will produce anti-helium, anti-carbon, and anti-oxygen. This is one of the anti-deuton candidates in 100 million deutons. And this is a bending plan. The top is the bending plan, non-bending plan, and this is the Chernikov angle measure the velocity. So the, this candidate has a charge minus one, mass 1.9, and just the opposite of deutons. Very clean event. Another is anti-helium candidate. Also, this is a bend, bending plan, non-bending plan, Chiron of corn. And this measures charge of minus two, plus minus 0.05, mass 3.81 plus minus 
and just the opposite of helium-4. In 10 years, the data show no background at the level of 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 10. Since there's no other magnetic spectrometer in space, so we will spend 10 more years upgraded detector to study the property of a heavy metal in the cosmos. So far, we see 50 million electron, 7 billion proton, 1.3 billion helium, and then lithium, brillium, boron, carbon, oxygen. For antimatter, we have 3.4 million positron antiproton. We have candidates for anti-helium, and we're looking for anti-carbon and the anti-oxygen. Let me now uh, share some results with you on cosmic radiation. What we found at low energy, order of a few hundred MeV to, to GeV, on any given year, any given day, there's hourly variation of cosmic ray. The radius is the flux value. And uh, for any month, every day from December 1st, December 7, December 15, December 22, every day is different. And every year the cosmic ray is different. So let me give you an example of daily proton flux. The proton flux, have, have, of course, have the 11 year long term variation. Short term variation can be non recurrent or recurrent. Non recurrent variation are typically from corona mass ejection, especially during the solar maximum. This is the proton flux at one, at one GeV. Recurrent variation are related to science rotation. Bottles rotation typical of 27 days. This is the periodic structure in the daily proton flux in the year 2016. In this uh, first half Sam, of 2000, yes? Sam, five minutes more, then we'll have time for discussion. Okay. And so this is uh, the first half of the uh, first half of 2016 and second half of 2016. You see period 27 days, 13.5 days, 9 days, and also you see 13.5 days and 27 days. The most important thing is the strength does not decrease with the momentum. It rather increases with the momentum. And we'll also study and observe hysteresis between helium to proton ratio and helium and you can see 2011, 2012, 2013, 14, 17. You combine this observation, you have a seven sigma effect. This is the latest data on electron proton and positron proton. And this is the proton flux versus electron flux, 2011 to 2014, and 2014, 2016. And 2017, it changes functional behavior in this part and this part are parallel to each other. For positron versus proton, you have a linear relation. So 20, 23 reports were published in physical review letters. So in 10 years, we recorded more than 200 billion cosmic rays. The accuracy and the characteristics of the data simultaneously for many different types of cosmic ray required development of comprehensive new model to match the accuracy of order of percent. But let me mention, okay, Igor Mostelenko and his collaborators have developed a new model. And in this model, it shows an analyzed data, analyzed data, it shows this excess of aluminum, which is additional component, and also an uh, addition revealed existence of uh, fluorine at the uh, low energies. Then there's superior Sarkar's model. So there are now many models which has uh, many parameters, which these parameters can explain most of the data. 
we, for the next 10 years, for upgraded detector, increase acceptance to 300% by adding a new tracker layer. The new tracker layer will improve the existing positron range from 1.4 TeV to 2 TeV and greatly reduce the error by factor two. And this is important because this will enable us to provide an accurate comparison with the dark matter model. And most important, measure this, the, the point on the right and see whether the spectrum really dropped sharply. And it also will give us a measurement of uh, an isotopy to 4.5, 4.5, 4, 4 sigma now. And this will also distinguish positron from this uh, sub, uh, Subir-Sakar model at high energies. For electrons, you will reduce the error by factor two, extend to three TeV. And this is important because then we will ascertain the source term, positron source term for electron from 95% confidence level to more than four sigma confidence level. Most important, with the increase of 300% acceptance, we will ascertain the properties of anti-helium and see provide the most sensitive look for anti-carbon and the antioxidant. We will measure the remaining 14 elements. So far, this 14 elements has very limited data. And this means we will measure the elements in, in, marked in white. And so space is the ultimate laboratory. It provides the highest energy particles. The space station is a unique platform to support the weight, provide power for precision, long duration magnetic spectrometer. Based on last 10 years, we can expect many more surprises in the next 10 years. So thank you, Sony. I finished. Thank, thank you, Sam, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I think there are so many new results, I'm sure there'll be uh, lots of comments and uh, questions. So please uh, uh, raise your hand if you have any comment. Okay, uh, we have a query from Sonali Bhatnagar. Sonali, please go ahead, ask Professor Teng. No, I couldn't see anything. No, I didn't know what. Oh. Uh, uh, my... uh, okay, uh, well, she has uh, on Zoom. Uh, uh, sir, I'm on the line. So, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can no, hear you. Please go ahead and ask you. Yeah, uh, Professor Ting, sir, this is wonderful. I've, I have uh, told my students about AMS, I've told my students about ISS, and now I'll be able to share these results with my postgraduate students. It was a wonderful uh, presentation. Thank you so much. <laughs> I don't oh, that's know, a Sam, remark. Yeah, that's that a was, remark, that was, not a question. That was a com compliment, yeah. Right. So, uh, yeah. So, one of the things is that, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, that uh, there's going to be this extra layer of uh, silicon detector, which will envelop mm -hmm. the AMS. So, uh, what is the time scale for that? Uh, you know, when do you see this being deployed? Uh, uh, NASA has agreed with us, in fact, I've told NASA, if the space station lasts till 2030, they should finish it in 2024. Okay. So Clearly, if you finish in 2029, there's no need to do it. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, time is time is of essence. So that is, that is certainly true. Uh, yeah. You had mentioned, there's one more question that I had. Uh, you had mentioned that uh, for some of these secondaries, the dependence is different, right? For uh, aluminum and uh, and some of the lighter elements. 
So yeah. is there any uh, idea that what could be the cause of it? Is it some propagation effect or is it acceleration? Or do we have any clue that what's going on? Um, every three years, we invite leading theorists to have a talk with us, mostly at CERN, sometimes in Canary Islands, in one of our collaborative institutes. And there are many theories, and I won't dare to judge which one is more correct. Okay. So the, when is the next one going to take place? I, I do not know. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, uh, I think, uh, yeah, please go ahead. Please go ahead, Sam. You were saying something. No, no, no. Any questions? Any more yeah, questions? Yeah, there is a question. Uh, uh, Razmik uh, uh, Mirzoyan has raised uh, his hand. So Razmik, mm -hmm. go ahead. Please ask Sam. Thank you very much, Sunil. Thank you very much, Professor Think. I I would like to ask uh, this variability of cosmic rays that you measure and then very clearly showed, hourly basis, daily basis. What is the interpretation behind? Uh, I uh, have told my collaborators, this is a very difficult experiment a magnetic spectrometer in space, you always have to calibrate. We calibrate every two minutes to make sure there's no change. So our first responsibility is to make sure the data is correct. We have a 15 nation collaboration. The data is published. Only three countries have the same results. Because when you have an accuracy, order of a percent, what is signal? What is the background? The subject to interpretation. And so all so far, if you look at all publications, we try to only concentrate on systematic errors and uh, concentrate, uh, not touch the theory. And there are enormous amount of publications, but I, we have not looked into that. The acceptance is very large. <laughs> acceptance is very large. So we're always behind in data analysis. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's right. Okay. Uh, there was a, a query. Uh, it's again not a question it, it, because your uh, lecture was also is being live streamed on YouTube. So there is a there is a query that uh, Professor Ting, uh, do you work on any experiment other than AMS? At this point no. of time, no. So I have always, through and my entire career, always working on one thing at a time. So last three decades have been on AMS. Yes. Okay. Not a, right. not not three decades. To, only twenty seven years. Okay. <laughs> That's more precise answer, and yeah. and I. You mentioned decade, but if I remember correctly, uh, it is 11 years since AMS was launched, isn't it? Yes. It's just about yes. 11 years. So yes, one solar we have, cycle. We have, we have, yeah, we have got one solar cycle covered there. Yes. Almost. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, I don't see any uh, hands raised. So uh, uh, let's thank uh, Professor Sam Ting for a fantastic talk um, and uh, for answering all our questions. Thank you very much, Sam, and good luck with the uh, with the with the silicon uh, shield. Yes, thank you.